my compassions they fail not as thou hast been thou forever will be great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, Christ his, his only Son, Son, our Lord, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died, and died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness, forgiveness of, of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. Amen. May God give you out of this world comfort as we dive once more into his word. You're walking on an ocean beach. It sounds nice, right? And it's not a still scene. Uh, there's movement because of the waves. The water rushes onto the sand and, and then ebbs away and, and flows again. And, and, and you're walking along enjoying the view, enjoying the whole thing. Seeing that this beach goes on and on and it's basically sand, water, and you. But then the waves wash something up onto shore. You see this thing show up just a little bit ahead, so you keep going and and you get right to the thing that washed up and, and you lean down to see what exactly it is. And it turns out it's a pocket watch. 
one of those intricate Swiss watches, one that's so impressive that it was made so you could see the gears inside. And wouldn't you know it, the watch is ticking. Pretty neat, right? You know what's one thing you wouldn't think in that moment? That the watch just happened. That the watch was really just a bunch of little parts or little pieces of metal out there in the ocean. And the way that the waves way out there moved against each other led to all these little metal pieces coming together into this amazing watch that's before you. That's not what you'd be thinking, right? You'd be thinking about how maybe that watch got there, knowing that it had to have a real cause for coming into existence. And not just a cause, but a designer, a maker, a someone with a plan for those metal pieces to come together into an elaborate, complex, specific thing. I'm not talking about a watch, am I? I'm talking about the whole world. This whole world is like a noticeable thing. We might call it a phenomenon, something you can see, detect, discover, and it demands an explanation. And this story of the watch washing up on shore has been used by believers to try to show people that there must be a God. Now, what are the chances that all the little elements in the watch would come together into a watch on its own? Technically, it's possible, but we all know that it's not, really. I mean, if you saw that watch just show up, you'd want to know why. It'd be a mystery that would bother you until you solved it. You wouldn't fall back on the idea that this watch probably just happened for all intents and purposes. It's not possible. And so with the design of our world, our galaxy being right where it is in the universe and our solar system being right where it is and the sun being right where it is and the earth being right where it is and the moon being right where it is and the distance between electrons being exactly what it is. All of that demands an explanation. It screams not of random chance, but of a maker. And yet there is a lie out there about God that is impervious to the watch picture. Even if you, with love for Jesus in your heart and trying to live a Christian life, even if you convince every single person in the world, all 7.8 billion of them, that our world is like that watch. And they all said, sure, there must be a maker. Even with all that, the lie that our verses for today warn us about, this lie could still win the day. We will be looking at verses from a letter in the Bible. This letter was written by the Apostle Peter years after he had been traveling around Judea with Jesus. This is Peter's second letter in the Bible, and when Peter wrote this letter, he was concerned about lies, lies that could make their way to the body of believers. And it seems that, at least in his day, there was one lie that he knew he had to fight against. Let's look at the verses. This is from 2 Peter chapter 3. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. And here, the word wholesome means single-minded, not having various motives, but a good, singular purpose. Peter wanted his readers to have that kind of thinking. Verse 2, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior 
through your apostles. Uh, Even in other parts of this same letter, uh, Peter has shown that it's important uh, what the sources of the messages you're taking in. He continues, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. And by the last days, Peter is talking about the entire era of time that's been going on from the time of Jesus up to our time. To the apostles, that wasn't a a distant thing, but an impending and sometimes even thought of as a present reality. So Peter is saying we can expect something and that something is for scoffers, those who mock the truth, to share their message. So what message? Peter gets to that in verse 4. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Do you get what they're saying? Do you get what the false claim is? It starts there as a question. Where is this coming, this arrival that God promised? The God that made everything has said that not only the beginning of the world, but also the end of the world, has him as the central player. All the religions of the world would say this, wouldn't they? That the God, the kind of God that they say is the maker, would be the one to bring about the world's end. And the scoffers, these liars that Peter warns us about, will point out that that there's a lot of time, there's been a lot of time, and it hasn't happened. We're still breathing, we're still here, generations come and go, but the one who is the central person for everything, God, hasn't been doing what we're waiting for him to do. Like they say in the rest of the verse, ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Do you get what they'd say about the watch? They'd say that, sure, the watch came into being because a maker made it. But then, it just washed up on shore. It wasn't gently laid upon the shore, given as a gift to someone, put on display. No, this, this created thing just was, was loose out there in the ocean, and so, of course, it would one day wash up onto shore. There was a plan for, for making the watch, but no plan for it after that. It was just left to float out there. So at its core, what's the lie? What's the lie about God here? The scoffers that Peter warned about were saying that it's weird the way history has played out, the history of the world God made. And they say that it shows we can't really find God doing anything. The lie isn't that God is too small to act in our world, as though God made a world too big for him to control. No, the lie is that God is aloof. You know, like cold and distant, maybe even preoccupied. So that God doesn't have his hands on the wheel. The lie is that God is aloof. As you think back to the choices you've made, just this past week. If all those choices were, were in, a, in a photo album and someone could just, just leaf through it and see your choices from this past week, would it look like God is at the wheel of your life? Do our lives of faith suggest that there's only a maker and not also a God who's still watching over the world? Peter continues, having just mentioned the scoffers with their lie about about God being aloof. Verse 5, But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth 
was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Peter wrote that the scoffers forget on purpose these three events. Creation, the flood of Noah's time, and the promised final day. Peter was saying that the same God who made the world, like that watchmaker, has still been acting in this world and will also act upon this world at the end. Even if someone were to try to explain away a worldwide flood by dismissing it out of hand and saying that there's other reasons for various things we see in the world, even if someone were to do that, that person would still have to come to grips with the fact that our world has been preserved. Just like how God preserved some of creation through the great flood, God has been preserving things, making sure that our world continues on. And this keeps on pointing to to that maker holding the power on the final day. But as Peter wrote, the scoffers deliberately forget, forget on purpose, all that. Don't we forget it too? I mean, is it really the God in control of all things that you turn to every time you get worried? Is it really God that you most dread losing instead of your savings? Is it really God that you're excited to serve instead of your own ego and pride? Is it really God that you're looking to for happiness instead of Netflix or sports or alcohol or social media? I'm not saying we're not believers, but are we really making sure to live our lives so that we stay that way? Or is it like God made us to be believers and then we act like he's aloof, distant, and not worth taking that much notice of? And that's why I want you to see the amazing truth about God that shows up in our final two verses. This is God flexing his muscle, revealing powerfully to us what he is like so that we don't have to look around in the world to find out, but he simply tells us. Verse 8, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. I remember hearing that verse when I was a lot younger. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. And though I had heard it, I didn't really think about it. It seemed like just a wise saying, the sort of thing you might see on a fortune cookie or something, like a, like a riddle, but probably a riddle that could never be understood. But notice that the saying is really two things. Taking the second part first, a thousand years to the Lord are like a day. Think about that. To God, a millennium is over just like that. I mean, there's a lot of days where I don't get that much done. A single day isn't that long. And to God, a millennium is like that. And knowing that about God, we might think that time is moving too fast for God to really be in control of it. But then remember the first part, that to God, a day is like a thousand years. Uh, The second part shows us that God has a, a big picture perspective, seeing all of history in one perfect snapshot. But the first part, that a day is like a thousand years to God, shows that he has been intimately interested in and guiding every single 
moment. And not only is that heady, but it may also be scary. Because if God cares so much about what's going on in the world, that he even says it's good for the destruction of the ungodly, then my life being on display is bad news because I've been so self-serving. But then we get to our final verse and we see that while we will never be as wholesome as the Apostle Peter would urge us to be, God simply is wholesome. And the kind of wholesome I mentioned before God is focused and focused on on one thing most of all. Let's look at verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. In every moment of every day, God is working on this. He is working on people's hearts. Not to convince them that he exists and that he made the world, but convincing them of something far more important. Convincing them that he loves the world. God loves the sinful world. It doesn't make sense, but that's grace. God is wanting nobody to end up without him. God wants everyone to come to repentance. And and the reason that anyone might not land in repentance and in God's arms forever is because of their choice. And yet God loves them too. So the people you know that might be denying God are having more than a watch wash up on their shore. What's happening is that God is sending out a flood, a flood of good news. God is washing over the world with the simple truth that God's Son was sacrificed for all sins. It's a flood that's been engulfing the world. And, and it's, it's a wildfire spreading, a wildfire of forgiveness that no one can contain. Even though historically speaking, Christianity should have died out centuries ago, but it hasn't died out. And not by random chance, but because of the wholesome, focused will of God for his kingdom to come. Where is this coming? It's here. Let's keep declaring it. Let's build our lives on it. Let's lean further into the truth that God has revealed. Let's live every day as an opportunity to glorify the God who makes every day shine with the love of his Son, given for you and me and the whole world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your kingdom come. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
to replace you, you are forevermore. And there's no other God I call to, you are the one that I cling to, you are forevermore. forever.